Um, so <clears throat> let's before I jump into this stuff right now, um, looking at this network right here, you've got um, you know, you've got your route here to this 172.17.0.0 network. This is this guy right here. You're coming from router D via 192.168.1.14. That's this link right here. Your dot 13. This is dot 14. So that dot 14 is your next hop. Then you got two values here. Uh, the 1700 is the advertised distance from router B. So 700 plus 1000, 1700. That's the advertised distance. That's what router B is sending to D and telling him. This that's the advertised distance from B. Then the next value, 3700 is your feasible distance, the actual distance you'll truly have to traverse from that router to get there. So that's that's basically your the advertised distance of B, the 1000 plus the 700, plus whatever the, the cost is here, in this case 2000. So 2000 plus 1000 plus 700, you get 3700. So that's the, the difference between your advertised distance, first value, and your feasible distance, the second value. So a feasible successor is chosen only if it doesn't create a routing loop. Here and here's where the, the language gets a little bit kind of scary. You just you have to know which which each of these things are. I, I myself had to read over this like a few times to make sure I was writing it down in the correct way. The advertised distance of the neighbor route for a potential feasible successor must be less than the feasible distance of the current best route composite metric of the current router plus the advertised distance of the neighbor router. So that, that's a lot of like terms that if you're not familiar with it, it gets very confusing very fast. So what it's saying is, okay, so we know our, our successor, again successor is the primary best route. We know our successor for the uh, 172.17 network from router D is to traverse from D to B to C. And we got it right here in our routing table. It's got a, a feasible distance of 3,700, which is the value we'll actually have to traverse, and an advertised distance from B of 1,700. So in order for, you've got another possible route over here, this 192.168.1.18. That's this link right here. Dot 17 is right here. Dot 18 is on A. You've got another possible link over here that, that could potentially be a feasible successor or, or backup route. Um, in order for that to qualify as a feasible successor, it's, and again, it, it gets really, really confusing on the, uh, the, uh, the wording, but the advertised distance of the neighbor route for a potential feasible successor, so that's the, that's the distance that A is advertising to D that say, hey D, it's, it's, this is the distance it takes for me to get to there, must be less than the feasible distance of the current best route. So in other words, whatever the advertised distance coming from A is for this route has to be less than the current feasible distance of the successor route. So in this case, for A, the advertised distance from A is 8,000 plus 1,000 plus 700, 9,700. So it's advertising 9,700 to D. That value has to be less than the... That value has to be less than the the current feasible distance. In this case, 3,700. So 9,700 is not less than 3,700. So it will not <coughs> consider this a um, a feasible successor. So you see, like it's it's going through here. It's got to go through some really slow speed links. This you know 5,000 here, 8,000 here. You know, very high composite values. So um, it. it Part of this is like the, just the way the algorithm works and trying to prevent loops and trying to keep best path. Now in the event, this is only for successor and feasible successor. Remember the feasible successor is stored in the topology table and is like immediately thrown into, you know, within one second is thrown into the routing table if the, the successor fails. Now since it's not considering this a feasible successor, it's not going to put that in the topology table. That doesn't mean that it's not going to still use this route in the event this link goes down. It just means it's not going to do it as quickly as it, it could uh, otherwise. So what happens if, since it doesn't consider this as a feasible successor because the advertised distance is greater than the current feasible distance of the successor route, in the event that this link goes down, it's going to you know change its topology table, 
It's going to be advertised out everywhere. It's going to change its topology table, and then it's going to run the dual algorithm again to determine its best route. So it's going to see that this is its only route there, and it's still going to use this. So it doesn't just because something is a feasible successor doesn't mean it won't be the route that it takes in this in the event this link fails. It just means that the because like this bandwidth is so high over you know you, you don't have a very good composite metric here. It's not going to consider this a feasible successor because of the way that um, the dual algorithm tries to prevent loops. So it's kind of a mouthful. Um, Make sure that you, you do know, though, what the difference is between a successor and a feasible successor and what the difference is between um, advertised distance and feasible distance. Successors, successors, the primary route it chooses, feasible successor is a backup route. Um, advert, or feasible distance is the actual distance to get to a network. Advertised distance is the distance that the next hop you would go to advertises back to your router and tell you, well, it's this far from me. Um, so that's... That's everything with that. So uh, dual in action. Um, this is a this is another. There, I, I said that the uh, EIGRP being Cisco proprietary is its uh, is its biggest downfall. To me, the second biggest downfall is the type of uh, terminology that they use. And you know, as you can see, successor, feasible successor, advertised distance, feasible distance, all of those get like really confusing. And then this, uh, the active and passive state to me is also kind of uh, confusing. Passive state is normal or at rest. That means it's, it's good to go, like you've got a route in there. Active state means it has lost its successor route and is actively searching for a successor. M my natural mindset would presume this to be the, the opposite. Like active to me sounds like, well, it's, it's an active route, it's, it's good to go. It's completely the opposite of that. Passive just means like the dual algorithm is not running, so you know that it's a good route. And you'll see in the topology table this little P here that stands for uh, passive. Active, it's having to run, it doesn't know the best route, so it's having to actively run the dual algorithm to find a route. So passive is good, active is bad. Uh, a router has to wait until all queries are returned. Um, it starts a stuck inactive or SI. SIA timer with the default of 180 seconds. So presumably like whenever um, it starts running this it would get it would get the queries back very quickly because that's the way the network works. But in the event something wasn't replying for some reason, it starts a, a timer that can last up to 180 seconds if nothing replies back. So and this is actually the same network we looked at before so Again, this was not considered a feasible successor, so it wasn't added in the topology table. This link goes down, it runs the uh, runs the query, and eventually it's going to realize this is the only route, so it's the best route, and it's going to uh, route traffic over here, even though it was not a feasible successor. EIGRP stub routing, um, it's a this is the preferred uh, configuration for hub and spoke topologies. Right here, you've got you know router A, that's your hub, and then you've got your spokes leading to routers B, C, and D. All the routers connected to the hub are configured as stub routers, so if the link between them and the hub goes down, stub routers immediately know the down router is inaccessible. So um, in, a, you know, in another type of network, you might have like interconnections between B and C, C and D, you know, running just all, all over the place. With a stub connection, these routers only have one connection here. So you don't have to worry about, like if, it, if the link goes down and these guys are configured for stub, all the other routers, like say this link here goes down, router C and D are going to know that that's just down and inaccessible because it was configured as stub, um, rather than having to, you know, try to, you know, look for, look for other uh, routes, run the stuck inactive timer, all that kind of stuff. You don't have to worry about that because if they're configured for stub, it just knows, well, that's the only connection to them. I can't get to them anyway. They immediately know that it's down and inaccessible.